Let's turn in our Bibles tonight to the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter 6. And we're going to read from the verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be in them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. From henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Amen. May God stamp with his own approval and blessing this reading of the Holy Scriptures. Now my text tonight is taken from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14 and my subject this evening is simply entitled The Story of the Cross. The text reads as follows, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now I am sure that some, if not all of us, are familiar with the words of the hymn, The Old Rugged Cross. And of course the first line in the chorus is as follows, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Think of the chorus. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Now that's a hymn that at least we sing the chorus at our communion service month by month. I was wondering, do you know who wrote the hymn and when it was written and why it was written? This hymn was written by a man called George Bernard in 1912. He was born in Youngstown, Ohio, but reared in Iowa. His father died when he was 16. He worked and laboured to support his mother and his sister by becoming a miner down the uh, copper mines in Iowa. He then later on got converted through the efforts of the Salvation Army. And then he left the Salvation Army and joined the Methodist Church to be a minister of the gospel. And in 1912, he was ministering in a place called Albion, Michigan. 
And there he penned that first verse and that chorus of this well-known, most beloved hymn. And the biography that was written about him recalls that it was easy getting the tune. But it took weeks upon weeks for the words to come together. He waited in prayer. Uh, he wanted to get it right. Uh, uh, and he wrestled before the Lord. Uh, and eventually the words came. And of course in 1913, 1914 with the outbreak of the war, the hymn was popularized by the evangelist uh, Billy Sunday who had it sung constantly in uh, his campaigns. Uh, the uh, rights for the hymn were bought by someone who was connected with Billy Sunday for and led to believe the tidy sum of about $500 back then. Now this hymn was written, I've told you when it was written and who wrote it, but it was written after George Bernard was ridiculed about his Christian faith in the local town council in Albion, Michigan. He went home very upset. He began to pray. He began to think of the subject of Christ's cross and his crucifixion. He began to think of Christ and the cross. And he was, of course, listening to the mockery and the ridicule and the sarcasm that was being hurled at Christ by his accusers. He heard the hiss of the serpent in the sarcastic comments. He saved others himself he cannot save. If thou be the son of God, save thyself and come down from the cross. Now, of course, that was something that the Lord Jesus didn't do and couldn't do. Now, uh, thank the Lord he, he didn't respond to these taunts. He, he, if he had to come down from the cross, there'd be no salvation for any soul. Uh, but for our salvation, he stayed on and he offered himself a once and for all sacrifice for sin. Remember Hebrews 10 and 12? But this man, speaking of Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And maybe you're here tonight. And you're upset by circumstances and situations that have come into your life. Maybe you've been left in a state of fear and you're fretting with worry. And maybe you're suffering the, the butt and the taunts of the unconverted. You, you feel you're being ridiculed and you feel you've been laughed at and you're mocked and you're branded. A, 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 a fool for Christ. And you, 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 you're very sad and you're upset and maybe even despairing. Could I say to you tonight, don't despair. I want you to turn to Calvary because as we sang, burdens are lifted at Calvary. I want you to, to think of the Christ on the cross. I want you to think of him being crucified tonight. And I want you to remember, if you're genuinely saved, you're a soldier of the cross. And like Paul, you can glory in the cross. Isn't this what he said? But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Now, the word cross is used 29 times in our Bible. And every one of these texts is full of truthful instruction about Christ and his person and work for the very well being of our souls. And even though we're here tonight, surely we have much to praise and thank the Lord for personally in our lives. Our temporal and material blessings has come from him. We have much to praise and thank the Lord for as a church. And, and we can glory, but, but Paul doesn't want us to glory in fleshly things or even in material things or temporal things. He wants us to, to truly glory in that which is spiritual. And, and as far as Paul was concerned, when he was dealing with those who taught another way of salvation uh, in the church at Galatia, who insisted that the Galatians had to be circumcised in the flesh, Paul argued no. And he said, even though they want to glory in your flesh, he said, but God forbid that I should glory. 
save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By him the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. See, he could have glory tonight in the birth of Christ. Marveled in the fact that Christ is God in the flesh. Marveled in his virgin birth, born of woman only. He could have gloried in the blessings of Christ. Remember it said of him, never a man spake like this man. And when Jesus speaks and you hear his voice, surely there is no voice like the voice of Jesus to your soul, especially when you're upset and in despair. But he gloried not in his birth or in his blessing, but he gloried in the bleeding of Christ. As far as Paul was concerned, the cross was a wonderful attraction. He began to think of who he was. He began to think of what he was like. And he had much to say about himself. But even though he was an Israelite indeed, a, a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, of, of the tribe of Benjamin, even though he was zealous and pious for the religion of his fathers, he said, that which was gain to me, I, I counted loss. He counted it as nothing. He didn't glory in his sufferings. Remember this man was beaten 39 times. <coughs> he was shipwrecked about three times. But all that he suffered paled into insignificance. He didn't glory in that. He gloried in Christ on the cross. And Christ in the cross is the very heart of the gospel. Now, now why tonight? Let, let me suggest three things. <coughs> Because there's a substitutionary aspect to the cross. God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he mean? He meant, I delight in the cross. I, I'm not ashamed of the cross work of Christ. If I'm going to boast in anything... I'll not focus on his birth or his blessing. I'll focus on his bleeding. Notice his person. He's given his full title here. Um, not only in this verse, but also in the verse 18. Our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, I want you to notice it's not merely Jesus. It's not merely Jesus Christ it's referred to. His full title Lord, that's a reference to his deity. Let's remember it's written, Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ, who is he? Not just a good man. Not just a great man. Not just a gracious man. All these aspects are true. But first and foremost, he's the God man. He's God in the flesh. Very God of very God. And yet bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. Notice the word Jesus, that's a reference to his humanity. One of his lovely titles is the Son of Man. I, I think of that verse often, Luke 19 and 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Isn't that the testimony of many tonight? I was lost, but Jesus found me. I remember as a lost sinner at the 18 years, 18 years of age. But glory be, Jesus found me. He was a seeking shepherd who was seeking for me, the sheep that was lost. Jesus came to where I was and he dealt with me in grace and mercy and brought me to himself. Let me tell you a little story. Way back in 1966 in the United States of America, there was a group called the Black Panthers. And they played a very short but significant role in the civil rights movement. They, they were part of the student protests. And they believed that non-violent campaigns had failed. And very sadly and wrongly, their language and their lifestyle was one of extreme violence. They preached a message of war, hatred. They wanted a revolution in the United States of America. And they used violence to get what they wanted against authority. On one occasion they robbed a bank. Very sadly, a guard was shot dead in the process. 
And one of the main organisers of that bank robbery went on the run. The FBI tried for 23 years to find that individual. And they couldn't find her. And after 23 years, they decided, well, we have to close the case. This woman has vanished into thin air. And you know, after 23 years in a certain police station, this woman came to the desk sergeant. And she said to the sergeant, I have a confession to make. And the sergeant, of course, who was writing, looked up and underneath the glasses and started to look at the woman. Yes, dear. Kept on writing a little bit. And she says, I'm a respectable pillar of the community now. I'm a socialite. I have a good job and I'm known by many even in the police station and I've dined with the police commissioner, so on and so forth. But I've got to tell you, uh, Mr. Police Constable, I have got a terrible guilty conscience. Because I did a deed, I was involved in a crime in the past. <coughs> and that crime has haunted me ever since. And I've come forward now to confess that crime. Because I have found Jesus Christ as my Lord and as my Saviour. And because I have got peace in my soul and rest in my <coughs> spirit. And discovered a willing and a seeking saviour to save the like of me. I have to tell you what I've done. And I'm willing to suffer the consequence. You see, there is not only a truth in Christ's person that he's God in the flesh. But he's the son of man who came to seek and to save that which is lost. Do you know you're a sinner tonight? Do you know you're a lost soul? And maybe no matter what your crime or sin is, I want to tell you the message. The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Look at the word Christ in the title. That's a reference to his ministry. Literally, it means the Messiah or, or the anointed one. Historians tell us, that there was roughly 30,000 people crucified by the Romans. I don't know if they were all in Palestine or the land of Israel or throughout the Roman Empire, but, but 30,000. And yet in the eyes of the Apostle Paul, only one mattered. 29,999 didn't count in Paul's eyes, even though he, I'm sure he felt for them and their suffering and loss. But there was one cross that was different. It's the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. God in the flesh. Who was sent in a mission of mercy to seek and to see if that which was lost. He who was anointed by the Father for, for fulfilling the work of redemption. It's his cross I glory in. You see, his cross was the cross of the God man. It was the cross of the God-man who was not dying for his own sins. Remember the only crime that they had against Christ was this. This is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And Pilate refused to uh, change the superinscription. He says, what I have written, I have written. Uh, the cross of the God-man was vicarious in that he suffered in the place of others. He did no sin. He knew no sin. In him was no sin. And because he was sinless, he offered himself up a once and for all sacrifice to God. And on the cross, the God-man was victorious. He, he took on the enemy. Death, hell, grave, the devil, sin. And uh, listen to what the, the, the Bible tells us in the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 2 and in the uh, verse uh, 14, he makes this tremendous statement, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. And the reference here is 
in himself on the cross. He defeated them all. He triumphed over them. Not only think of his person, but think of his passion. When you think of the cross, you normally think of a wooden object. I want you to think not only of the wood of the cross, why that's important. It's the work that's more important. You see, Paul gloried in what Christ did. Because on the cross he was a substitute. He took the sinner's place, your place and mine. On the cross he was a surety. He was paying a debt that we couldn't pay to the broken law. He, he was the sacrifice. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, he, he was the sin bearer. Remember, the hymn writer wounded for me. Wounded for me there on the cross. He was wounded for me. Gone my transgressions and now I am free. All because Jesus was wounded for me. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. He, he was the sin offering. He, he, he suffered the wrath of God like the Old Testament sacrifice was burnt with fire while well, the fire of God's wrath fell in Christ till he cried out my God, my God why hast thou forsaken me all to become our saviour thou shalt call his name Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins and when you think of Christ not only think of his person but think of his passion what did that involve? It involved, yes, physical and mental agony that's beyond my powers of description. But think of his suffering as a substitute, a surety, a sacrifice, a sin, a sin offering, so that he could become our saviour. There's a substitutionary aspect to the cross, and that's why Paul gloried in it. Notice quickly and secondly, there's a sanctifying aspect to the cross. He says in the second part of the verse, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. What does that mean? The word world here doesn't refer to the planet. I believe it refers to people. People in rebellion against God. The evil world system that fights against God. In other words, the anti-God, anti-Christ spirit that causes the world to be arrayed against Christ. Remember what this psalmist could say in Psalm 2. He made a tremendous statement about the world and his attitude to the Lord. We read here in Psalm 2. Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and their rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, and the Lord shall have them in derision. You see, that's the attitude. Now, now let's apply that to Northern Ireland. I, I've been thinking recently about the Equality Commission and taking the Asher's Bakery to court over the refusal to bake an ice cake uh, with the subscription to support same-sex marriage. I have been thinking about the Human Rights Commission who have went to court to argue for the woman's human right to have an abortion in Northern Ireland. We wrote a letter to them on behalf of the Government and Morals Committee. We, we strangely got a reply. Uh, of course, they didn't agree with our analysis of uh, the situation, but at least we got a reply. And when I think of the word world, I'm thinking of a society that fights against God and his word, that, 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 that militates against Christ and the message of the cross. Of course the devil is behind them, the powers of darkness. 
and individuals are just front men, spokesmen of the evil one. They're, they're being used. Maybe we could illustrate it this way. Think of the Apostle Paul in the Damascus Road. He was a madman. He was really a persecutor of the people of God. If you want to put it bluntly, he was a terrorist against the church. People were being murdered. People were being imprisoned. And then he met the risen Christ, or the risen Christ came and revealed himself to him and brought Paul to his knees until he was pricked in his heart. And Paul cried out, um, Who art thou, Lord? And he was told, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And then his next question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And in an instant, the persecutor became a, a true believer. Uh, the, the terrorist became an evangelist. Uh, and soon this persecutor was preaching the very gospel. Let's remember that Christ defeated this anti-God, this anti-Christ spirit of the age. He has won the victory on his cross 2,000 years ago. The world system hated Christ. The world hated Christ and crucified Christ. And that's what Paul means when he says, By whom the world is crucified unto me. Just as this world system hated Christ, so this world system hates me. And in my relationship to this ungodly society, I have a, 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 a spirit w within me that, that, that recoils from that system and rejects that system. Remember the psalmist said in Psalm 139, 21 and 22, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I not grieved with those that rise up against thee? Those that rebel against the Lord and those that are re reckless against the Lord and his ways. Uh, we, we certainly want to hate their sinful language and their sinful lifestyle. Uh, and um, the question begs to be asked, uh, shouldest thou love them that hate the Lord? And the answer is no. And why does the world hate us as Christians? Uh, why does the world want to persecute us? Uh, all because we love Christ. Uh, and, and the cross work of Christ sets us apart. It, it has a, a, a sanctifying effect in our relationship to the world. And one final thing. There's a satisfying aspect to the cross. Note the last bit. And I unto the world. I, I'm really struck uh, with the word I in the text. Um, but God forbid that I should glory. That, that is, I delight in the cross. I boast in the bleedings of Christ. And in my relationship to the world, I'm crucified unto them. You see... The world looked upon the likes of the Apostle Paul as good as dead. He's despised, he's hated, he's persecuted, he's loathed. The attitude to Paul is like their attitude to Christ, away with him, crucify him. Uh, Paul was accused, like Christ, of being a, a pestilent fellow. But Paul was not in a popularity contest. He was not looking for the well done of the world and the pat of the back. And I just want to throw this in. The church of Jesus Christ should never be on a popularity contest. And, you know, sometimes we think that we have got to conform and to change to make ourselves more popular and appealing to the ungodly. Now, we have no intention, of course, of going down that road. We want to remain faithful to Christ. But if we remain faithful to Christ, we will not be popular. We will probably be persecuted. You, you think tonight of uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bull uh, and what happened down in their bed and breakfast in Cornwall. And while we have every sympathy with uh, what they've been going through, it's never been brought to the uh, BBC News. Um, they, they, they have had... Uh, a dead rabbit nailed to their gate. They have had paint throwing in their dwelling. They have had obscene phone calls. They had threats in their lives. They certainly had cancellations. 
And what was their crime? Have they done something terrible, something horrible? They refused to accept a, a, a same-sex couple into their B&B. See, they're being faithful to Christ. Faithful to their conviction. Let me finish with this thought. Remember Pilgrim's Progress again? Christian and faithful come to Vanity Fair. And their lifestyle is different from those in Vanity Fair. Their clothes are different. Their talk is different. Their choices are different. Their tastes are different. They're laughed at. They're mocked and ridiculed. And what happens in Vanity Fair to Faithful? He's murdered. That's right. John Bunyan wrote it in the book. He's tried in a mock court. And he's burned at the stake. And you see, that's what the world thinks of the true Christian and the child of God and yet the reality is to become a follower of Christ and being a true Christian that's what it takes and if that's what the world thinks of Christ that's what it thinks of the Christian and how are we going to be overcomers? deny Christ? no, delight in Christ we glory in his cross we fill our mind with who he is and what he has done for us. We, we, we gaze upon the, the bleeding wounds of our Saviour. And like as we thought this morning uh, of the uh, closing hymn of Isaac Watts, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life and all. I think again of the words of stud, of Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. And you think of the fanaticism that is at this moment in time, especially among the extremists in the Islamic world and militant um, Islamists throughout the Middle East and African countries and other places, and the, the barbarism that they'll go to, to to defend a false prophet and a false religion. And of course, what we need is men. What we need is women who, whatever the cost, whatever the shame, whatever the hostility, will be willing to identify with Christ and stand up for King Jesus and wear his crown. Paul says, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Do you know, that's a tremendous thing. Such was his identification with Christ that the cross was not only substitutionary to Paul, but because of Christ's work on the cross, he was sanctified. He was different by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He took delight. He gloried in that. In other words, it satisfied him. It gave him great, tremendous joy and pleasure. That's the story of the cross. Not a full story, but just a little part. And I trust that the Lord will take these few words and the Lord will bless them to you.